Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Vixen ED81S F7.7 Aprochromatic Refractor. Street price somewhere between $11 and $1,200. And you know, Vixen, quality Japanese company, they've been around forever, most people know who they are, several iconic products within our hobby, and yet it seems like I still view them as underdogs for some reason never quite broke into the first tier of manufacturers when you think of Mead, Celestron, or Orion, or some of the others. Came close several times. I can remember in the late 1990s, the Polaris series of Vixen mounts. The Polaris, the Super Polaris, the Great Polaris, the GPDX. I think some of us assumed that those were just going to be the mounts that everybody used. I myself invested heavily in that system, and then, I don't know, we started using different mounts. But again, so many different iconic products within our hobby. Vixen, well known for its refractors. They had a GPC-102 back in the late 1990s. Check out the price. Those are $1997, and that's an Acromat. It's a 4-inch Acromat. But yet it was such a highly sought-after telescope that people I knew saved up to get one of those. Vixen also wasn't afraid to take a few chances. They've had some quirky products through the years. If you can remember, they had a 140NA Neo Acromat, 140 millimeters, pretty big for a refractor, two space doublets in a Petsfall-like configuration, big telescope, and yet it's an Acromat. That one has a bit of a cult following of its own. There's also the R200SS, the 8-inch F4 Newtonian. That thing has its fan base as well. There was also the VZAC, the Vixen 6th order A-spheric Cassegrain. Looks like a Schmidt Cassegrain, but it's actually a different design. Among the most sought after refractors were the 4-inch F9 fluorites from the 1990s. They partnered with Celestron and with Orion. You can find one of those today. Some people regard those as some of the very finest 4-inch refractors ever made. Vixen has had a tendency over the years to marry outstanding optics with ordinary mechanical assemblies. This was definitely the case with the fluorite refractors that I mentioned before, and there's been a small cottage industry for people trying to upgrade the mechanics on those. I bring that up because it's certainly the case here. It doesn't look like much when you take it out of the carton. In fact, it's very ordinary looking. The focuser is good. It's not like some of the jewel-like construction that you see on some refractors today, including some of the ones from China. But you know, Vixen's never been about that. It's always been about the optics, and the other stuff just kind of goes along for the ride. This willingness to be different has garnered a cult-like following among Vixen fans, people who won't use anything else. I mean, who else would make an 81mm refractor? I mean, everybody else makes an 80. Some of them make 76s, but only Vixen would make an 81mm refractor. The reputation of this telescope has preceded it. I've gotten a lot of mail from people who have wanted me to review this thing saying it is an outstanding telescope. So let's get it up on a mount and see how it looks. So here it is, the Vixen ED81S atop a Vixen Porta mount. This telescope is small enough and light enough and has a short enough focal length that you could conceivably use it all the time on an Altaz mount like this one. The mount costs about $300 and it'll hold a variety of small telescopes. So if you wanted to use this at higher magnifications, you do want to put it on an equatorial mount where it will track for you. And you definitely want to do it in this case because the optics on this guy are fantastic. So here it is on a traditional equatorial mount. This is my Celestron CG5. And yes, people who own these things have written to me to tell me that these have really great optics and this may in fact be one of the great 3-inch refractors available today. Having seen this one, I think I'd have to agree. The optics are terrific. And I spent night after night looking at the moon and double stars and any deep sky objects I could find. The only thing I wasn't able to see were the planets, Saturn and Jupiter are away right now. And it's springtime, it's the realm of the galaxies. A three inch refractor isn't exactly what you think of when you want to bring out something to hunt down galaxies. But you know, hey, you play the hand that you're dealt. So night after night I was using this thing and I had a lot of fun and you know what? Some of the best reviews are the ones where I have very little to say and I really don't have much to say about this guy. You know, I had it out at the same time as the CN212, that Takahashi, and of all things the Galileo scope. I was going back and forth between them and having a really good time. So 
One thing about a three-inch telescope trying to hunt down galaxies is, let's see how far we can go. And I was looking through the Virgo cluster, and I think I found most of the M objects there. A little bit dim, but challenging. It's a lot of fun. So I did some astrophotography through this thing, both lunar and deep sky. We had a terrific stretch of weather here in late March of 2021, making up for a winter where I couldn't do much of anything. But anyway, night after night, I went out with this thing and caught these images of the moon, one right after the other. I placed them side by side, and it's a nice souvenir of my time with this telescope. So as far as deep sky goes, I did take quite a few images here. You'll see some early winter images and later ones taken in the spring. Some of these galaxies were challenging to get. M101 and M51 are dim, and this is only a 3-inch refractor, but you can see that it did a fairly good job on those, as well as some spring objects here, including M3, the globular cluster. So the premium 3-inch refractor market is a competitive one. It's a buyer's market out there. There are lots of really excellent telescopes competing for your money. And in this case, some of the competition comes from within Vixen's catalog itself. They have in their catalog a version of this, the venerable and reliable Orion ED80, in their version. This is the Vixen ED80. Very similar specifications. It's an 80 millimeter f7.5. This is an 81 millimeter f7.7. The issue is this one costs, depending on how you measure it, about half what this one does. What gives? Well, some of it is this is a Chinese product and this is a Japanese source product. So here we have the two telescopes side by side. They are similar looking at first glance. This is the Rickson version of the ED80. I've done quite a bit of material on this telescope and its variants. This is the ED81S and when you see them close up you see they're actually quite different. So the first thing you want to notice is despite the fact that the ED80 has a wider diameter tube the ED81 actually has more baffles inside. In fact, there are quite a few of them down here. This one has two or three, depending on how you count them. Both of these lens cells are not collimatable. I've had people ask me that. This is a standard uh, Sinta Chinese-based ring system. A little, something a little bit odd on this one. These rings are not hinged. They sort of friction fit closed here. Those do not open. A little bit odd. I've had a couple of people ask me, will the visual back materials fit here? So in other words, if you have the field flattener for the ED80, will it fit the ED81S? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. So this is the visual back here, and you'll notice the polarities are different. These are male threads, and the ED81 is female threads. So this one has its own dedicated field flattener. So turning these over, you see another difference in the focusers. These are very different here. There's your standard focuser here you see on an inexpensive Chinese apochromat. This one is much beefier and much more substantial. You've got a two-speed focuser here. You've got a lot more adjustments here as opposed to here. And I also noticed this one is able to bear weight a little bit better than this one. I was hanging some pretty heavy stuff off here, big fat eyepieces, diagonals, and cameras, and so forth. So whenever we do comparisons like this, the inevitable question comes up, is this worth the extra money? Well, the problem is there's no set answer to this because everybody has a different definition of value. Yes, I think the ED81 is better than the ED80. It's a little bit sharper, a tiny bit contrastier, and if you raise the magnification to unreasonable levels, you can start to see some false color in this one that is invisible here. I don't know in practical terms if you're really going to do that in daily use. But is this worth it? Well, I think if you're a beginner, you're going to be hard-pressed to see the difference. I think most people looking at these two, even if they could tell the difference, probably would tell you that it doesn't matter to them and it's not worth the extra money. But therein lies the rub. Refractor owners are not most people. Refractor lovers are slightly crazy. I know, I'm one of them. I pay exorbitant amounts of money to get a tiny bit extra performance out of a refractor. And here's a comparison on the moon through all three telescopes. 
these images were taken within minutes of each other using the identical settings in SharpCap and processed with the same settings in Registax. I sent this graphic out to club members and asked for their comments. First, notice the ED81's image is a tiny bit bigger and a tiny bit dimmer due to its slightly longer f-ratio and focal length. About a third of them came back and said the ED81's image was a little bit better. Blowing this up, I think I can see what they're talking about. I also have to point out these differences are quite small. Also, you're probably seeing this in 1080p, so the differences may be wiped out due to its lowered resolution on your screen. I'll put a link in the description if you want to download the full-size JPEG and pixel peep for yourself. If you find that comparison too hard, and I don't blame you, here's an easier one against the $69 Galileo scope I've also reviewed on this channel. Note that I was unable to use the same settings this time due to the large differences in focal length and f-ratio between the scopes, so this test is less rigorous than the previous one. I'll also link this one if you want to see the full-size JPEG. These should not be considered scientific tests since there are just too many variables to control. For one, you're trusting my ability to focus. But it is at least something to look at, and these comparisons are always fun to do. So, there you have it. A look at the Vixen ED81S Refractor. One of the very best in its class that I think I've seen, at least this sample. Anyhow, I hope this has given you some information to decide if this telescope is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.